Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. The Lord is already here and moving, so we'll go right into what He has. And uh, <clears throat> Helen has already gone into lots of detail about why the Incarnation. Thank you, my dear, for that. And what I want to talk about deals with the Incarnation, but it really deals with a specific issue that Jesus identified and brought to us understanding of. And that is the heart of God. Because I think sometimes in the world people have an idea that the Trinity is divided. They think that God is the bad cop and Jesus is the good cop. That Jesus is a nice one. And of course they don't even understand the work of the Spirit. But I'm here to discuss the fact that God is one, the Trinity is not divided, and the heart of the Father, the heart of Jesus, the heart of the Spirit is one and the same. So I want to go, in the time we have left, to quickly show that what the Father feels for us is the same thing that Jesus does, the same thing that the Spirit does. There is no division in the Trinity. Amen. And Jesus came to reveal something specifically that was not as clearly revealed. Helen alluded to it, but I'll be able to explain it a little bit more. So the first scripture is from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And Helen mentioned about the fact that in the Old Testament it was punishment and so on. But that was not the heart of God. As she mentioned, because of disobedience, the way the covenant was structured, when they disobeyed, things were allowed to come on them. But what we want to focus on today is what is God's heart for us? Is Father a bad cop and Jesus a good cop? What is God's heart? So yes, we must admit that in ancient Israel, because of disobedience, penalties came on people because of the law. But that was not God's heart. That was not God ever wanted for His people. So today we want to look at what is God's heart and how does that link into the Incarnation? As was mentioned, people in ancient Israel didn't fully understand the concept of God as a Father until Jesus came. When Jesus came, that concept, that idea, was clearly explained. So now in verse 2, Now in these final days, God has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. So God spoke to the prophets, but notice it says, in the final days. So Jesus has the last word. Amen? Amen. He is the Alpha and Omega. He has the last word. So what He says to us, supersedes and surpasses what may have said previously. It may build on it, but the word of Jesus is the final word and should fully show what is the heart of God. So let's look at a couple of the prophets. We can't go through all of them, but let's look at two prophets and see what did they know about the heart of God. The first prophet we want to look at is the prophet Jonah. You know the story of Jonah. We don't have to go through the story. Sent by God to the city of Nineveh in Assyria, he ran away. And God had to create a great fish to swallow him up, to cause him to do what God told him to do. So we know the story. But at the end of the story, when God did not destroy the city of Nineveh, Jonah learned something about the heart of God that we need to be really aware of. Can we move on to the next slide? Great. So Jonah, this is the point where Nineveh, Nineveh has repented. Jonah wanted him to destroy, but that was not God's heart. And this, today we're looking at what is God's heart. So Jonah has a recognition of God's heart. Oh Lord, I knew from the very beginning you would not destroy Nineveh. This is God's heart. So any idea that God is here in heaven with a big hammer and you step on a ladder and <coughs> he hits you. No, that is not the heart of God. That is not the heart of God. In the ancient Israel, because of the law, when they disobeyed, penalties came on them. But that was never God's heart for the people. Let's see what God's heart is. I left my own country and headed for Spain. Look at God's heart. You are a kind and merciful God. You are very patient. You are always show love. Is that the kind of God you grew up hearing about? A God who is kind and merciful and patient and always shows love? I knew when I grew up, in my denomination years ago, there was a lot of emphasis on punishment and it seemed as though uh, the Father was there waiting to hit you. And Jesus had to say, no, Dad, give him a break. 
<laughs> and that is not the heart of God. He is kind, He is merciful, patient. You always show love, not sometimes show love. And in the New Testament, of course, that understanding is expanded. We know that God is love. But at the time, this is what Jonah understood. You don't like to punish anyone. How does that square with what you knew about God? He doesn't like to punish anyone. That knocks down a lot of things you may have heard. God is not there waiting for people to step out of line so he can bang them. He is not. He doesn't like to punish anyone. You, you, some of your parents, do you like to punish your kids? You say, I'll get them today and wait till they make a mistake so I can swallow them. No. <laughs> no. No parent does that. God is no different. He doesn't want to punish anyone. And Jonah, being a Jewish background, he's surprised that God doesn't even like to punish foreigners. <laughs> Jonah's view of God is very limited. He didn't realize that God is God of all, and he has concern enough for all people. So he has learned this now. So this is what some of the prophets are telling us about God. What else can we learn from the prophets about God? Next slide. Jonah was under a vine that God had caused to grow for him to keep the sun from off him. And then the Lord caused the vine to die. So now Jonah's upset. And the Lord says to him, you are concerned about a vine that you did not plant or take care of. You grew up one day and died the next. In that city of Nineveh, there are 120,000 people who cannot tell right from wrong. And many cattle are also there. Don't you think I should be concerned about that big city? You see what I have in yellow? Many cattle are also there. In other words, God is also concerned about your pets. <laughs> A few years ago, there was an idea that was circulated that God was about to wreak punishment on, on Los Angeles, on California and LA, and we would be destroyed in the earthquake. And people were being told, leave LA, move east. And is that God's heart? No, it didn't happen. People prayed, and even if it were supposed to, God is a merciful God. He cares about your kitty cat. He cares about your cows and your sheep. That's the God we know and love and serve. It is so far removed from what people in the world may have heard. You need to tell people that. Yeah. God even loves your kitty cat because you are concerned about it. If you will not destroy Nineveh because of the people and the cattle, why would he destroy California? Amen? He is a merciful God. So these are the things the prophets are telling us specifically about the heart of God. Kind, merciful, patient, loving, doesn't want to punish. Let's go even further. Uh, next slide. Ezekiel 33. God tells Ezekiel, Tell them, as surely as I am the living Lord God, I don't like to see wicked people die. Do you really realize that? God does not enjoy seeing wicked people die. When you see mobsters and gangsters die, People say, ah, oh, good, God got it. No, God does not want to see them die. He wants to see them turn from their sins and live. That is the heart of God. He doesn't enjoy seeing even the guy like Hitler die. He'd rather that he turn from his sins and live. That is the heart of God. We don't often see that happening because people disobey, but the heart of God is mercy, forgiveness, and love. When Jesus came, next slide, he showed the people that he was even greater than Jonah. We won't have time to read through everything. But he says, a greater, the people of Nineveh repented when Jonah came. He said, but here is someone greater than Jonah, and you're not listening. Next slide. Jesus says again to the people, the queen of Sheba will stand up and condemn this generation because she came to hear Solomon. And now someone greater than Solomon is here. Why is Jesus using these examples? In Israel, there were three classes of people very close in that sense to God's direction. The prophets and the priests, the kings, and of course all the temple attendants and high priests and so on. Next, next slide. Here again Jesus says that he is greater than the temple. So Jesus is saying, listen to what I have to say. I am greater than all the prophets. I am greater than the kings. I am greater than the temple. And that implies the high priest and everything the temple stands for. I am the one. So listen to me. What I say about God 
you really need to hear because I come with the heart of God and what I have to say is meaningful to you. Whatever you may have heard from the temple rituals, from the prophets before, is, will be superseded by what Jesus says. Amen? Everybody with me? Amen. Okay, so we should be very careful as to say, what is Jesus going to say about the Father? Next slide. Jesus says, My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly understands the Son except the Father. No one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So we should be like this. What does Jesus say about the Father? It is simple, yet it is very profound. Next slide. This is the heart of the Father. Eternal life is no you, Jesus says, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God doesn't care about burnt offerings. He doesn't care about sacrifices to gain His favor. That doesn't work. Jesus, has, as Helen mentioned, Jesus has done it. He has had a perfect and complete work. And what God wants now is the relationship with His children that Jesus has made the way for. It's, it's, it's so simple, isn't it? That's all God wants from you. He has already done it all. Jesus has paid it all as our intercessor. And now God the Father wants a relationship with His children. Next slide. What did another prophet say about Jesus? This is a quoting from Isaiah. Could you move on? This is fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. A bit of history. At the time when Isaiah wrote this, from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, the nation, the northern nation of Israel, had been captured by the Assyrians and taken to captivity. The people in that area who were left were downtrodden by the Gentiles. Many Gentiles were brought into northern Israel. So the Jewish people there were dominated by Gentiles. They were in a sad state. And God told them that in the midst of this darkness, there will be light. There is hope. In other words, my heart is towards you. You are going through a tough time now, but don't give up. Next slide. It's interesting, the color slide there, that's the Middle East. It covers countries today that we would call part of Turkey, Iraq, Syria, and Iran. So the Assyrian Empire, and this prophecy to Israel to encourage them was about the time of the Assyrian Empire. And it's interesting that these are the same countries today that we're having trouble with in the Middle East. Syria, Turkey's having problems with all the uh, ISIS people. Iraq and Iran. So in a sense, we have a similar situation today where there's trouble for Israel. And Israel is really a type, a microcosm of God's overall plan for people. Amen. And at that time, God was telling the people, don't be afraid. Yes, you're going through a tough time. You've been captured. You've been migrated away from your land. But I will send light in a dark place. And Jesus came to fulfill that. Next slide. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. We just read about the fact that God promised the people in ancient Israel, you're in a dark place, but I'm going to send you a great light. Those who are dwelling in darkness, I will send light to them. In other words, hope. That light is Jesus. It says here that in Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So what happened to ancient Israel that Isaiah prophesied about? God is saying, Jesus is the fulfillment, the fulfillment of that prophecy of light coming into dark places, light coming into the world. When Jesus came, he brought the light of God into the world. Amen. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 4, uh, next slide please. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, the Incarnation. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now Isaiah mentions that the area that Jesus, that the prophecy in Isaiah 9 was about was called Galilee of the Gentiles. Could we see the next slide? There's a map here of Galilee and of Israel during Jesus' time. Could you see the yellow portion? That portion is called Galilee. That area to the coast where the sea is, that is known as Galilee of the Gentiles. That is where Jesus grew up. Nazareth is part of Galilee. 
He later left Nazareth, Nazareth and went to Capernaum. But that entire area is called Galilee of the Gentiles. So what I'm saying is this. Even as God promised the Israelites in ancient Israel, you're in a dark place, you have suffering, I'm going to send you a light. When Jesus came, he brought light to that area. He came primarily to teach and reach the Jews, but he also ministered to Gentiles. And that was a type, an announcement of the fact that he was savior of the entire world. That he was the light of the world. In fact, he said, I am the light of the world. So he lived physically in a place that was spiritually dark. He came as the light of the world and showing the heart of the Father, which is to reconcile people to him. <laughs> Next slide. We were reading from Isaiah chapter 9 about Galilee of the Gentiles. This is also from the same chapter where God promises a light and darkness. That light comes through the form of a little child. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very common Christmas hymn, you probably all know it. Unto him, unto us, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Priests. So Jesus, we're saying, is the light that came into the darkness, and that darkness represents the whole world spiritually separated from God. So to bring it to a close, what is the heart of God that Jesus reveals fully to us? Next slide. The heart of God is a heart of mercy, a heart of kindness, a heart of patience, a heart of forgiveness, love, and relationship with His children. That is the Father God that we know and serve, and that's the God we should be telling people about, especially at Christmas time. Jesus is the reason for the season. He's the light that came into this dark world to tell people about the love of the Father. Let people know as you meet them, God is not after you, He is for you. And Jesus coming into the world is a reminder of that. Amen? Amen.